So imagine you are me. Exactly 10 years ago, winter time, spring is in the air, just like it is now. And I was traveling to London for the very first time of my life. Uh, I was enjoying the city, soaking up every experience. I just ate this amazing duck and piccalilli sandwich at Bora Market. I went vintage shopping on Portobello Road, just like in the movies. And now I got myself a free entrance ticket for the National Gallery, because in Britain, most museums you can enter free. And I sat on a wooden bench in front of a painting made by William Turner. I'm looking at the color palette, the glowing radiant orange of the setting sun. Or is the sun rising? I don't know, could be. The two ships slowly approaching us, the one stoking and pulling, the other one graceful, floating, heroic. I'm looking at the expensiveness of the composition, the uh, depth of the contrast, the serenity of the whole, and then imagine the smacking sound of a guy next to me forcing a pastrami sandwich into his mouth. <laughs> and as I look at him with annoyance, he tries to apologize with a smile, which is actually quite impressive with such a big sandwich between his mouth. And I see he's in working gear. He tucks his helmet in between his knees to, uh, to catch up the crumbs of his sandwich. And I look a bit further and I see that he's not the only one. I see a guy in a suit and a briefcase, a banker maybe from the city. I see a little bit further, I see a lady in a Royal Mail uniform gazing at another impressionistic artwork. And as I wonder, why these people spend their hard-earned lunch breaks in a museum among tourists. Mr. Pastrami abruptly stands up. We make eye contact. He nods towards the fighting Tamarare, and he says, makes you feel human, doesn't it? And then he walks away. My name is Camilla, and I grew up in the 90s and zeros. I am an early millennial, as they call it. I had no realistic role models. My working career started in an economic crisis, and um, my chance of finding a job was almost impossible. I grew up in a world of either you make it, and if you don't, there's absolutely nobody else to blame but you. You just didn't manifest it well enough. Yeah, it, it was hard, I know. But I don't feel sorry for myself anymore. And do you want to know why? Because there's a new generation in town. Gen Z. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You make me feel so much better because, you know, I heard you all have curling parents. <laughs> all your problems have been solved and swiped away in front of you. You never learned how to deal with conflict hypersensitive, you're constantly searching for inner growth, your work needs to fit you instead of you need to fit the job prescription, and you're longing for self-actualization, and you spend all day on social media discovering a way to have an impact. Wow, thank you for, feeling me, for making me feel great and fine. And by the way, I am here to talk about art because, you know, that's what I do. I am a professional in art. At home, I have a library that covers my entire living room wall with works like uh, Homer's Ilias and Odyssey, um, Dante's Divine Comedy, James Joyce's Ulysses, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Mm -hmm. I have art hanging on my walls and on our Sunday mornings, Bob Dylan is playing a lonesome tune. So, yeah, naturally, I was very pleased when I was invited to hold this TED talk for you. I, mean, because, yeah, I know art. And as I was ready uh, to write this spectacular TED talk for you, I sat behind my desk and I looked around in my living room and I wondered, when did I become so stuck up? I mean, <laughs> I'm a 90s girl. My first concert was to the Spice Girls. Um, on my Saturday night, night, I watched America's Funniest Home Videos. And on my first date night, I danced to No Diggity. 
And yet I stand here in front of you to talk about art. During my teens, I never thought, I like art, let's do art, or I need art. What I did need was a path to self-actualization. I never searched for art, but art helped me on my search of becoming me. So how did I grow from the Spice Girls to Bob Dylan? Well, art is accessible and not only reserved for the elite. You don't need to spend hours in a museum. You can also just go in and out on your lunch break. You don't need to tackle complex works like Ulysses. You can also just start by reading The Hobbit because you liked the movie. Think of art like wine. Ex yeah, start with what you like and in time, explore its nuances. It's okay if you don't like something initially. Art has a way of surprising you later. Now, the reception of art and its impact on our well-being is what I'd like to dive into today. Art is everywhere. Art is silently waiting for us to be recognized in the space between luxury and necessity. So and in these next 12 minutes, I'm going to show you that having art around you is a basic need. So when you think of art, you might think of the concept of it and whether you like it or not. But when you experience art, you are always in the now, in the present. It takes you over, it makes you feel a certain way. It surprises you in ways that you never thought of before, only to find yourself again later with renewed belief in yourself and that what you feel is real. It makes you laugh and laugh. It disgusts you and it can heal you, but only for that sheer moment in time that you are experiencing it. Before and after, there's only the concept of it and your thinking takes over again. So when it is time to make decisions about your basic needs. What place on the scale of necessities does your mind rank art? People use the word need a lot. You go to the shopping center because you need a pair of jeans. Uh, you're hungry too, so you need to have a sandwich. And oh, uh, you're thirsty, so you need to have a drink. And it started to rain outside, so you need to take the bus home. Oh, reminder, you need to pick up your bike later. So when you get home, you're okay, you're feeling a bit grumpy that it started to rain. Uh, you're happy with the jeans that you got, although you're not so happy with your body type. Okay, that's, that's okay. Uh, you, you're happy with your, with your sandwich. It's okay. And in time, this day will have faded away, only to be filed in your mind under the R from rainy day with wet socks. Now I have a question for you. Do you ever go to the shopping center thinking, I need art. Do you ever think that you need art at all? Maybe you don't feel like spending money on art. Maybe art is for when you're older and you have more time at hand, or maybe art is just not your thing. But what about that one song that you and your mother used to dance to that brings a smile to your face every time when you hear it? What about that Netflix series you watched, and you couldn't stop wondering about it, you couldn't stop thinking about it after you've binged the last episode. What about that graffiti painting of a woman turning into a tree on the side of that concrete building that you hate? You love the painting. It made you stood still in the middle of the road. Why? Why does that make you feel so good? This is the Pyramid of Maslow. It is made by professor psychologist Maslow in 1934. It is a theory that can explain how human and universal needs are the source to motivate people. It also goes by the name of hierarchy of needs. The first four levels are considered your basic needs. Level one is eating, air, sleeping. Level two, is about safety and stability by having a roof over your head and some money to spend to buy your food. Now, and if level one and two are fulfilled, you open your eyes to level three. Social interaction, love, family, belonging. 
And after that, level four, esteem, uh, success, valuing yourself and others. And now there's something about that blue upper level. That is the level of growth. The blue upper level is about self-actualization, about developing yourself. And it is powered by the longing of being a better person, of being your best possible self. Now, a small side note, the blue upper level isn't confined to art. Self-actualization can be found in various activities, such as creating, reading, studying, traveling. But I dare say they have an overlap and a base in the field of art. So I dare say art is the key to self-actualization, to self-realization. Numerous people think that art is a luxury. When you have time to worry about your growth, it's a luxury problem. It's not a real problem. It's not a necessity. In a democratic world, the majority decides about art and where to find it. For instance, if the majority doesn't like a new public sculpture in Flissingen, there will be no new public sculpture in Flissingen. This is a true story, by the way. Last month, a sculpture in Flissingen was removed from the harbor because the people of Flissingen didn't want a sculpture there about slavery. It is as simple as that in a democratic world. And I say democratic because in an autocratic world, people, leaders commonly use art as a way to make propaganda. But that's a whole other TED talk. So in this democratic world, the majority has a say in your blue upper level, has a say in how you can feed your growth. It is time to start recognizing the art that is around you, that is feeding you, that is challenging you. Why? Why do I need art, you might think? Well, it can give you empathy. Empathy. The ability to share someone else's feelings or experiences by imagining what it would be like in that person's situation. Now, last Tuesday, um, I did a rehearsal of this TED Talk and I got some feedback. Uh, they said, well, it's a hard topic here that you go going into, so you might need some visualization. Uh, so I said, no, no, this is a TED Talk audience. These are TED Talk people. They don't need visualization. They can go into me, into the deep. So bear with me. How does art grow your empathic ability? Three ways. It trains your ability to understand different kinds of behaviors. Two, it teaches you about all sorts of emotions. And three, it gives you social reflection. One, perspective shift and understanding behaviors. Artworks such as paintings, sculptures, movies, literature and movies and music often presents different perspectives than your own. They create an entire fictional world that compels the audience to follow the choices the fictional characters make. Though those, though those choices may be far away from your own thinking and doing. Take the play Medea, for instance. It is a play about a mother who kills her own children to punish her adulterous husband. Though the concept of it may be disturbing, you'll find yourself sympathizing with her. You walk out of the theater bewildered, thinking, what did I just watch? Why did I cry for that woman? Did I recognize something of myself in her? Or is there some universal emotion at hand here that allowed me to connect with her? Art teaches us about ourselves and fosters empathy. Don't kill your children, though. <laughs> Being able to look at things from another perspective and understanding behavior touches the levels four and three of the pyramid of Maslow, esteem, love, and belonging. Expression of emotions. Artists often, often use their work as a way to express their own emotions. Observing or experiencing these expressions can help you become aware of and connect with different emotional experiences. Just being able to read emotions that are not your own 
enhances the levels of safety for you and for others. You can read situations that might be dangerous for you more quickly, and at the other hand, people feel safe around you because you can give them emotional safety. Social reflection. Art often reflects society and its diversity. By experiencing art, people get the chance to understand the social, cultural, and political context of others. Empathy breaks strategies and makes us less egocentric. Being able to show empathy allows you to connect with others, and that will broaden your perspective. This also strengthens the level of love and esteem in your life. To conclude, empathy is a result from art. Therefore, art contributes to self-actualization, but at the same time, the result of art and what it does to you personally is embedded in the levels of your basic needs. When the logic to understand each other falls short, art steps in, connecting people on a deeper level. Now, in London's National Gallery, I felt connected to Mr. Pastrami, and he felt connected to me, a semi-hip tourist lady in a too tight vintage winter coat who smelled a little bit like Duck and Piccolini. In a world divided by conflicts and lacking understanding, art has a power to build bridges and offers empathy. But in a time of conflict, art itself is under threat. Art, when not created in freedom of thoughts, can be used as a way to control people. Or it's not valued at all, at all and will receive less attention and less funding. Because, after all, why focus on such a luxury thing like art? Well, at the same time, we need to defend our borders. Oh, yeah, you can say what you want about the topic I just brought up. But what does it actually have to do with the essence of art? And does the funding of art come after, out of the same wallet? I'll tell you, it really doesn't matter. Because in a discussion like this, art never wins. Art might be everywhere, but the effect of, his, of it is always personal and subjective and easy to overlook because art is a silent force. One drop of water doesn't split the mountain, but millions of them do. And that is the same in society. One person doesn't make a country a better place to live in, but millions of them do. So ask yourself, what kind of world would you like to live in? I would like to live in a world of empathy, imagination, a world of excitement. If you happen to be in London and you have some time to spare, pop into the National Gallery, sit on a bench and spend a few minutes with the fighting Temeraire. Watch her being taken to the docks for scrapping, the last voyage of a once so powerful naval ship that served against the Battle of Napoleon. William Turner, the painter, understood the emotional impact of the scene. The modern era, era arrives. One generation makes way for the other. The Temeraire makes, makes a ghostly impression. And the prominent setting sun reminds us of what awaits us all. Makes you feel human, doesn't it? Now, I have one final quest question to ask you. How do you feel right now? And I'm looking especially at the students. Next time when you're having a live presentation, a public talk or a debate, please remember the arts. Because for this TED talk about art, I used art, the art of rhetorics. Art comes in many ways, and it will surprise you. Art is everywhere. Thank you.